Everybody, it's the weekend interview show where I get to talk to my heroes. My name is Scott Horton, and the hero I'm bringing on the air right now is an investment advisor, a radio show host. He's the director of public policy at the Downsize DC Foundation, two time libertarian presidential candidate, and the author of 11 books, including Why Government Doesn't Work, The Great Libertarian Offer, Liberty from A to Z, and he's working on his new one, The War Racket. How politicians use Americans for their own ends. Mr. Harry Brown, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thanks so much. Pleasure to be back with you. Oh, it's great to have you on, sir. Uh, Harry, let me ask you, if you had won the election of 2000 and you had been the president on September 11th, how would you have responded? Well, first of all, September 11th might not have happened if we'd had a libertarian president because a libertarian president would have, by September, have made great progress in bringing the troops home from over 100 countries around the world, closing the over 700 foreign military bases that the Department of Defense operates. We would have announced that we were shutting off all foreign aid to uh, foreign democracies and dictators alike, and a number of other things uh, that would point out that we were no longer going to meddle in foreign affairs and that we were going to focus on defending this country, which we saw on December 11th was undefendable. We have the largest national offense in the history of the world, but we have virtually no national defense whatsoever. We we can't protect this country from any two-bit dictator who gets his hands on a nuclear missile, and we can't defend it from terrorists who want to run airplanes into the World Trade Center. So I think that it's very unlikely that September 11th would have happened. If it had happened, we would have focused on trying to track down the people who did it, get extradition to bring them home, put them on trial, and prosecute them accordingly if found guilty uh, to sentence them accordingly. But if we did not succeed, we would be no worse off than we have than the Bush administration is today which has failed to capture the leaders of al-Qaeda, even though it's captured a few minor people along the way. But there would still be a 1,000 American soldiers alive. There would be tens of thousands Iraqis still alive. We would not have created far more opposition to America than we had before 9-11. And so, obviously, I think that what the president has done is dead wrong. He is doing exactly the opposite of what he should be doing. Does that answer the question? (laughs) Sure. Do you think that the whole thing, uh, your project, would have been done by the end of December 2001 then, huh? Well, if it weren't done by then, and if there were some parts of it that we couldn't get Congress to approve of, such as shutting off all foreign aid, then uh, it at least would have shown that we were moving in that direction. And I doubt that those who engineered and supported the 9-11 attacks would have wanted to attack until they figured out or or saw what it was that we were going to achieve in that direction. You know, this tape that Osama bin Laden did last weekend that received very little publicity for a day and then disappeared off the radar screen was very significant. He pointed out in the tape that he had no opposition to America's freedom. He said if we did oppose freedom, we would have attacked uh, Sweden, for instance. And, of course, I've been pointing out for three years that Switzerland is just as free, just as democratic, and just as prosperous as America, and it wasn't attacked by Osama bin Laden or anybody else, and, in fact, never has been attacked by terrorists in any way, shape, or form. And, secondly, Osama bin Laden pointed out that if you don't attack us, we're not going to attack you. We don't want to do this sort of thing. Now, whether or not he was sincere, it was worth looking into. All right. Hang tight right there, everybody. It's Harry Brown on the Weekend Interview Show. We'll be right back. All 
right, everybody, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm your host, Scott Horton. And the guest this hour is Harry Brown. He ran for president twice as a libertarian. He's written 11 books and is working on his 12th, The War Racket. And uh, it is my honor to have him on the show today. My uh, my producer, Chris, had a question for you, which was, if, if you were a libertarian president and something like uh, September 11th happened, and you just described how you would uh, try to fight uh, a battle like that in just arresting or killing the very top few in al-Qaeda and calling the whole thing off, well, what would you do if you were a libertarian president with a Republican Congress that demands to continue to give foreign aid to Israel, for example, or demands that you go on a total war and overthrow the Taliban? Well, the president has to carry out what Congress legislates, and presidents, of course, in recent years have been doing more than what Congress has legislated, and just scaling back to what Congress legislates would be quite a difference. But I think also if presidents can do more, then they can also drag their feet. And we need to recognize that if you did elect a libertarian president, this would tell you something about the temper of the times, because the president would have been elected on a platform of a non-meddling foreign policy, a non-aggressive foreign policy, and a reduction in government. And Congress would be on guard uh, of they would not want to go against the public will. That doesn't mean they wouldn't vote against the president, but it does mean that you would probably get a lot of support in Congress for the president's policies because these had just been shown to be popular with the American people. So I, I don't find that to be too difficult, but there is so much that the president can do on his own, such as bringing the troops home from overseas, such as announcing that we would no longer have an aggressive foreign policy. The administration does set the foreign policy and then relies on Congress to legislate the money to make it happen. But we're talking about a foreign policy that would use far less money. One area of that, for example, is that we're currently spending somewhere in the neighborhood of five or $600 billion on the national offense, on the military, the uh, individuals in the military, the armaments, uh, uh, the foreign bases, all of these things. Uh, some of it's in the, in the Department of Defense budget, and some of it is buried in other uh, departments. But the point is that we have no defense, as I said before, and if we focused on defense, we could defend this country for about $50 billion a year. All we need is a missile defense. We need to make it clear that anybody who actually threatens the United States and then carries it out, would be subject to a reward for his assassination, a reward of maybe a billion dollars or half a billion dollars to be won by whoever can bring it off, but only if the aggressor actually carries out his threat. I think that would be enough to back off on any threat that an aggressor had. And I think that there are other things that can be done. One last point with regard to this is that the federal budget is $2.4 trillion. Now, don't you think if you were the President of the United States and you had $2 trillion at your disposal, that you could hire the best minds in the world to find a way to take care of these problems without going out and killing tens of thousands of people? I really think you could. Mr. Brown, as we speak, uh, the Marine Corps and the U.S. Army have surrounded the city of Fallujah in Iraq and are preparing for a massive assault now that the presidential election is over. Um, as far as I know, it just started. I don't know. It's, it's coming very soon. So my question to you is, uh, how can we leave Iraq right now? Well, I think, the, there? I think they have enough trucks and ships and planes to just get in them and leave. Uh, the, the question of how to leave, this came up with Vietnam also. How do you leave? Well, you say we're leaving and then you leave. You don't have to win the war. You don't have to lose the war. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is leave when you're doing the wrong thing. And the mark of an intelligent individual is to be able to recognize where he has made mistakes and correct those mistakes and not uh, perpetuate them, thinking that somehow if he keeps on doing what he's been doing before, that the results will change. And if that's what is successful for an individual, it's successful for a nation as well. It is the wrong thing to be in Iraq fighting against the Iraqi people. This is not liberation. It is occupation. And uh, 
it is wrong for America to be occupying Iraq, whether or not we eventually subdue the resistance. So the, the point is that we shouldn't wait for elections. We shouldn't wait until all the resistors have been shot. We need to get out, and if we need to get out, we should do it immediately. Harry, I uh, you had a conversation with an A-10 pilot who bombed the no-fly zones for 10 years and yeah. participated in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And, um, well, it wasn't so much a discussion as it was an argument. And what it really came down to was my belief as a libertarian that actually the state is the opposite of liberty and this Air Force pilot's belief that, no, actually the state is what protects my liberty. And all those guys who are buried in Arlington uh, are there in order to keep me free. And if they hadn't all died to keep me free, I'd be a slave right now. Well, America has not been invaded since 1812. That was the last time any foreign government invaded the U.S. Every war the United States has been in since then has been a case where America has gone overseas. And that includes even uh, the Second World War, because even though Pearl Harbor was bombed, there was, still was no invasion of the United States. So we have never been in the position for almost 200 years in which our military has been necessary to defend this country. It has always been preemption. It was preemption in World War I, in World War II, in the Spanish-American War, in the Gulf War, in Korea and Vietnam, in Iraq twice, and on and on and on. Panama, Grenada, I mean, the, the number of invasions and attacks that our government has engineered, it just goes on and on. It's a very, very long list. But never once has our country been threatened. And that means that when they talk about our military being overseas, defending us and fighting in Iraq so that uh, we don't have to fight in New York, they are simply blowing smoke. There is no threat to this country from Iraq. There never was a threat. And anybody who is president of the United States, if he doesn't ask to see hard evidence, to actually see the evidence and be fully convinced, that there is a very definite threat that is going to hurt America before he sends out men to die and to kill innocent foreign civilians, then that man does not deserve to be president of the United States. You know, I was reading HarryBrown.org last night, and it made me feel really good. You know, as much as people worry about all this global conquest, I was reminded that global conquest is just another government program. It can't possibly work, can it? No. And that's an important thing to realize. The Department of Defense is simply the post office in fatigues. We know the government doesn't work. We go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and our uh, anger seethes because we just can't stand the lines, we can't stand the inefficiency and so on. And we see the same thing often with the post office. When things get lost and there's no way to track them, all you can do is to put in a complaint and uh, hope that something happens, that you get reimbursed or whatever. Uh, but the difference between dealing face-to-face -face with any government agency and dealing face-to-face -face with private companies who are competing uh, to get your business is so obvious to us. But what we don't realize is that the FDA and the Department of Defense and the FCC and all these other government agencies are just like the post office and the DMV. Uh, they are run on the same system, and as a result, they don't work. Government is force, and force is never an efficient way to accomplish anything in this world. And again, I have to come back to the point that with $2 trillion at your disposal, you ought to be able to find a way to achieve some results without killing people. Is it possible in this day and age, as economically interdependent as we are with the rest of the world, to have our government act independently? Of course. And we are not isolating ourselves from the world. We want to do business with the rest of the world. We want to buy foreign products. We want to sell products to foreigners. We want to visit foreign countries. We want foreigners coming here. We just don't want our government acting on our behalf, confiscating our money, and then attacking other countries in our name so that we then become subject to attack. Every time the president invades another country, every time the president strong arms some other country to support us in exchange for a bribe to that government, 
we are creating more enemies and we are putting innocent Americans at risk. Those 3,000 people who died in New York on September 11th were not the guilty people who had been bombing Iraq for 10 years. They were not the people who gave the orders to invade Panama or to invade uh, Kuwait and Iraq in 1990. They are not the people who have been strong-arming other governments. They are not the people who have been putting military bases in foreign countries and causing very bad public relations for America. They were innocent people, but it is always the innocent who suffer for the uh, crimes and the sins of the guilty people running the government. We do not want the government putting us at risk by telling other countries how they must live. Oh, I hate to do this, but i got to bring up the election of last week. Sure. It occurred to me as I was walking out of my electronic uh, polling machine booth that what right do I have to choose somebody else's ruler or them mine? Well, I think that's a very important point. And to me, it makes sense only to vote libertarian or not vote at all. If you're voting libertarian, you're voting for someone you hope will be elected and will then uh, undo all of this ruling. In other words, repeal regulations and laws that cause one group of people to force their way upon other uh, groups of people. But it's important also to realize that at this point, with the legal obstacles that face a third party, uh, the vote total is meaningless. What you're doing when you vote Libertarian is just pointing out that you are no longer going to support big government. All right. We'll be right back to talk about the campaign rules. That's some interesting stuff. It's a weekend interview show. Over. Everybody, welcome back to the weekend interview show. I'm your host Scott Horton, and the guest is Harry Brown. Now we were talking before we went to break there about um, the election and the campaign finance and ballot access laws. I was going to ask you, uh, looking at the election results from uh, 96, 2000, and now 2004, is it possible that there's really only 300,000 libertarians in America? No, I think that there are millions of them. That's not to say that we are the majority in America, but any time any poll has been taken by ABC News, by Roper, by Gallup, or anyone else, and asked, would you prefer a smaller government with less services available to you, uh, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. The, uh, the yes side goes anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. Uh, this is not to mean that these people who uh, answer the poll that way would also say, yes, I want to repeal all the drug laws, yes, uh, I want to repeal the income tax tomorrow morning. Yes, I want a foreign policy that brings all the troops home and so forth. But it does mean that people in America are aware that government is too big, too powerful, and too intrusive. But we have to recognize that there are institutional barriers to any third party. There are ballot access laws that consume a tremendous amount of a third party's resources that could have gone into advertising, which must instead just be spent trying to get people on the ballot. Uh, ballot access laws that impose uh, requirements on third parties that are not imposed on Republicans or Democrats. And in addition to that, the campaign finance laws obviously have not hindered the major parties from raising money. But, in fact, they do hinder third parties from raising money because third parties are in an entirely different position. And that $1,000 or $2,000 limit per person is an enormous problem for third parties. And uh, you can go on further. The, the uh, major parties are subsidized by taxpayer money. The debates are subsidized, and the debates are run by the Republicans and Democrats. So, big surprise, there the are no third-party could, candidates in it. The Libertarians could get subsidies, too, if they wanted to, couldn't they? Uh, well, I, quali I qualified for matching funds in both 96 and 2000, but obviously I can't take them. I don't believe uh, in welfare for uh, individuals. I don't believe in welfare for corporations. And I certainly don't believe in welfare for politicians. 
and what kind of a libertarian candidate would I be going out and talking about reducing the size of government and myself taking money from the federal government to run my campaign? It, it of course, would uh, show a decided lack of integrity and make everything else I say seem very hollow. So uh, that that alone right there is an example of how libertarians are put at a disadvantage. Uh, but nobody should be getting uh, campaign funds from the government, obviously, and so libertarians are the only ones who act on that principle. Now, given these uh, institutional barriers, it's important to realize that the object of a presidential campaign should not be to get votes. There are two things that a presidential campaign can do, and they are very important and should be done. One is to acquaint thousands or millions of Americans with the fact that it doesn't have to be this way, that you could live without an income tax. You don't need to be roped into a fraudulent retirement scheme like Social Security. We could have much more peace and lower crime in the cities if we repealed the drug laws, and we would not have to live in a state of siege if we just simply changed American foreign policy and, and things of this sort uh, that benefit the individual and doesn't the individual doesn't know about if there isn't a presidential campaign, which is the one uh, operation of the Libertarian Party or the Libertarian movement in general that actually has access to national television and national radio. I was on about 55 national television shows in 2000. I don't know how much many Mr. Badnarik was on this time, so I can't uh, refer to his campaign. Uh, but I'm sure we'll get a report on this sometime soon. I was uh, also on almost 100 national radio shows, plus hundreds and hundreds of local uh, TV and radio and national uh, press interviews like in USA Today or with the Associated Press and so on. And this is the kind of publicity for libertarian ideas that can't be obtained in any other way. Think tanks do, uh, li libertarian think tanks do a great deal of good, but they're not in a position to do that kind of outreach. Now, the second thing that a libertarian campaign can do for a presidential campaign is to get, generate inquiries that will bring more members to the Libertarian Party. Because in the final analysis, the only way we ever will get a vote total like 5, 10, 15 percent or more is when we can run a campaign of 10, 20, or 30 million dollars. Now, there are two ways to get it. One is to get a very rich person to run for president and then just hope and pray he doesn't embarrass us. Or number two, increase the size of the Libertarian Party to a couple of hundred thousand members so that we have a fundraising base large enough to support a 20 or $30 million presidential campaign. And once we have a campaign like that, if we have a candidate who's giving a pure Libertarian line, we could turn this country around. But we can't do it with what we have now, and it's foolish to focus on the vote total, because focusing on the vote total actually can take away from the task that the presidential campaign really can do. For, in, for instance, uh, having bumper stickers with the president, uh, presidential candidate's name on it is a mistake. The, the bumper stickers should say, vote libertarian. The yard sign should say, vote libertarian so that all candidates on the ticket are uh, profiting from the whatever publicity you're getting. Well, and I have to say, I learned about the Libertarian Party from watching you on C-SPAN in 1996. It's the Weekend Interview Show. We'll be right back with Harry Brown. Hey, everybody, please check out the bumpersticker.com. That's my own company, believe it or not. I'm no longer a worker. I'm now a capitalist and owner of my own business. It's the bumpersticker.com, featuring such wonderful stickers as... I blame you. You voted for Bush. America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. John Quincy Adams. Contradict authority and over 400 more anti-state, anti-war slogans. So please check out the bumpersticker.com. <laughs> year was 1996. The place, my living room. The thing, the remote control in my hand, and the channel, C-SPAN. And as I flipped through, 
I saw something called the third party debates. And, of course, there were four candidates up there giving a debate, the Natural Law Party, the Libertarians, I believe Howard Phillips from the Constitution Party, and there was Harry Brown, the Libertarian. And the question was, when you're elected president, what are you going to do about abortion, or, or what's your position on abortion? And uh, Harry Brown, who I had never heard of or seen before in my entire life, gave the answer, something to the effect, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, that, you know what, it's none of your business what my belief on abortion is because I'm running for president, and the president of the United States doesn't have the slightest bit of authority on that issue, and so you don't get to know. And I thought, wow, he looks like a Republican, but he's not. Interesting. And that's where I began to learn about the Libertarian Party, just like he says, from watching a Libertarian presidential campaign. And that is eventually what uh, got me set on the road to being an individualist, lowercase l, Libertarian myself. And so I owe you great thanks for that, Mr. Brown. Well, thank you for uh, telling me that. I appreciate it. And regarding the campaigns, I have my own radio show, which is on Saturday nights on another network. Our and sister network, Genesis. Oh, it is your sister network. Well, I didn't know we had a brother, but that's great. <laughs> uh, but I mention it because tonight I will discuss in more detail the campaign, what you should expect from a libertarian campaign, and what must be done, I think, to be able to uh, have a bigger impact in 2008 than we had in 2004, and I have a lot of ideas on this subject, and needless to say, and so you can tune in. You can just go to my website, harrybrown.org, and right at the top of the homepage, uh, you'll see a link to the radio show. It's on at 10 Eastern, 9 Central, 8 Mountain, 7 Pacific, and I guess that's 8 a.m. in Baghdad. <laughs> yeah, and harrybrown.org, by the way, is a wonderful resource besides just your radio archives, which you have on there. But you also have Harry Brown's journal and uh, lots of great articles that you've written, and uh, I just love it. I, I spend uh, plenty of time reading harrybrown.org every week, and that's uh, Harry Brown with an E on the end of Brown if you're not familiar, folks. And if you're just tuning in and you missed most of this interview, uh, you could go to weekendinterviewshow.com sometime in the next few days, and the archive of this interview will be up there. Um, and let's see. Speaking of HarryBrown.org, I read an article that you read, or um, pardon me, that you wrote about the Statue of Liberty and the anniversary of uh, the people of France giving the Statue of Liberty to us on October 28, 1886. And then you kind of go through and compare the difference between America of 1886 and America of 2004. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the statue was donated by the people of France, and that does not mean that the government taxed the people of France in order to make a great show of uh, benevolence by giving uh, the statue to us financed with taxpayer money. It was actually the people of France who voluntarily raised the money to build the statue and send it across the ocean, and then once it got here, it was, uh, again, money voluntarily raised in order to build the pedestal for it and erect it in New York Harbor. And on October 28, 1886, uh, the statue was unveiled for the first time. And you would think that would be a national holiday, but it would be more likely now to be a national holiday if it was the statue of the world's policeman or the statue of the last superpower or something of that sort because we no longer celebrate liberty in America but uh, in the article that you speak of, I attempted to compare 1886 with 2004. In 1886, we had no income tax. We had no Social Security system. We had no drug laws. Uh, we had a benevolent, peaceful foreign policy. Uh, and as a result, uh, people didn't put in 50% of their income to, into state, local, and federal taxes. Uh, the actual tax burden was something less than 7%. And in many, many other ways, uh, we were so much more a free country then than we are today. And the result of that, I think, is that we should try to be working to marry uh, 19th century freedom with 21st century technology. And if we did that, we would create the most prosperous country the world has ever known and the freest country the world would, has ever known because – the technology can help us be freer, and the freedom can help the technology. Well, and, you know, we really have come quite far uh, since 1886, maybe further than the time allotted uh, should have allowed for. Um, 
But, you know, many conservatives blame individualism for the destruction of Western civilization, basically for the, the corruption and decadence now and our move toward empire. And the polls say that last week George Bush won based on social issues, that the American people want the state to protect our culture that uh, appears to be under attack from every direction. Do you not think that the state should be involved in such projects? No, of course not. Uh, do I really want Teddy Kennedy and George Bush and people like Newt Gingrich or Bill Clinton uh, deciding what is moral and what is immoral and uh, what my value should be and what kind of a family I should have? I really think not. Uh, I don't presume to be the smartest person in the world, but I know I can handle my own affairs far better than Teddy Kennedy can. Uh, and yet that's what they're saying. When they say, well, look, uh, we have a Republican president, a Republican Congress, and we will impose only the best possible values, even if you believe that, what's going to happen when the Democrats take over Congress again? Uh, then you're going to get uh, exactly the opposite of what the Republicans want to do, except that now the Democrats will have the power to do it because the, pres uh, because the Republicans created that power. And it's important to realize that the problem is never the abuse of power. It is the power to abuse. Once you give politicians the power to do something, it will always be used in some way or other. It will always be abused because uh, sooner or later the kind of people you don't like are going to have that power in their hands, and they're not going to pass up the opportunity to use it forever for whatever they want. And that's why Jefferson said we should bind them all down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. And the Constitution was a contract that said the government has the right to do the, and the power to do this, that, and that, but nothing more than that, and nothing uh, in addition to that can be taken on by the federal government. And there's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes the government to decide what our morals should be, uh, how we should live, how, who is uh, properly uh, suited to be married, and all of that sort of thing. And so the idea that we should trust George Bush and the Republicans to take care of cleaning up uh, the, uh, the social environment in this country is really ridiculous because they are the ones who have contributed to the very, very bad culture that we have today, uh, the lack of family values and so on. I mean, they're the ones that have voted for all these federal programs that have taken uh, responsibility away from individuals and made them dependent upon the state, which, of course, leads to the kind of things that they now decry. So the old saying about you have to have morality in order to have liberty, it kind of goes the other way, too, that if you take people's liberty away, their morality will, will uh, go away with it. Yes, uh, actually, it isn't a case of liberty creating responsibility or responsibility creating liberty. Liberty and responsibility are exactly the same thing. When you have freedom, you automatically have responsibility because you will face the consequences of your own acts. There will be nobody you can uh, slough them off onto. And if you have responsibility, uh, or let me say you can't have responsibility unless you have liberty, because you can only be responsible for what you can, con can control. And if the government is setting all the rules and controlling you, then obviously you can't be responsible for anything. So it's a question that freedom and, and uh, responsibility are actually the same thing. One doesn't lead to the other. They are the same. And if you want responsibility, then you have to have freedom with it. And that doesn't mean people like George Bush or Pat Buchanan or anybody else deciding what is proper for your family, what is proper as the way to raise your children, or anything else. Pardon uh, me for going so, on so long about that. Oh, no, I, I love it. That's how I like to do this show is ask a general question and let you go on until you're done. Uh, I don't know if that makes really great radio for the listeners, but that's what I want to hear, so that's okay with me. Uh, and I, now I want to touch on a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and I just my, you should have seen my face. My eyes just lit up when I saw that you wrote an article called Abolish the FCC. Yeah, well, there again, it is ridiculous to have bureaucrats in Washington deciding what we are equipped to listen to, what we can handle, in effect. That's what they're saying, is that we are so stupid that we can't decide for ourselves what is the proper uh, radio or television broadcast to listen to, and therefore the FCC. 
I mean, the FCC has to make these decisions for us. Well, but, Harry, what about when we turn in to see some nice, wholesome family violence in the form of a football game and we're exposed to a terrible breast? <laughs> right. You know, if my wife hadn't been in the room with me when that happened, I would not have believed that I saw a breast. Uh, I saw what happened, and I thought, well, it's just some kind of an optical illusion. It must have been a button or something that I saw. And uh, But my wife said, no, I think uh, it really was a breast. But then, of course, it was confirmed for me by the two weeks' worth of commentary on television that made a big thing out of it. If the commentators had shut up about it, uh, I probably still wouldn't know to this day whether or not I saw a breast. And if I didn't know it was a breast, then how in the world could it have been harmful for me? And I think the same thing would be true of any small child that saw it. But that really is beside the point. The point is that... Uh, there was such an outcry about this that CBS would never let that happen again. Whoever produces the Super Bowl program next year is going to be absolutely sure that something like that doesn't happen again. Uh, so why do we need to spend millions or billions of dollars on a government agency to see that it never happens again? It didn't prevent it from happening the first time, so why should we rely on a failed agency to protect us when we know that the marketplace does protect us, that any time something bad happens, it never happens again. Okay, well, the question of what we see and what we hear on our electronic communications channels is uh, is one thing, but then there's also the question of bandwidth, and uh, or not bandwidth, but you know what I'm talking about, the the, uh, the spectrum. The available, the available yeah. uh, channels and bandwidth. Yeah, don't we need a centralizing authority in order to uh, divvy up that space? Actually, we don't, uh, because what happens is the it is the centralizing authority that has limited the space in the first place. Uh, most of the listeners of this show are probably not going to be as old as I am, and remember that when television first came on the air, there were only 12 channels available, not because there were only 12 channels possible, but just because that was what the FCC created and uh, and limited it to, and then when was it? Maybe uh, maybe in the 1960s, I guess, they opened up the ultra-high frequency channels uh, so that we now had channel 14 and 18 and 22 and so forth. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, because of the limitations of the FCC, uh, cable television came to us. Uh, it came, first of all, as a way of getting better reception, but uh, secondly, as a way of getting all kinds of things that weren't subject to the FCC regulations. And there is no limit, probably, to the technology uh, that could create additional channels, whether you're talking about radio or television, but the FCC artificially limits the amount of channels available, then says, well, because of this limited availability, somebody has to decide who gets those channels. Now, as far as somebody interfering with somebody else's channel, that's no different from somebody else entering your house without your permission. Uh, we have laws against invading other people's property. We don't need additional laws and additional agencies to enforce them. All we need is for the police and the courts to enforce it. When somebody says, my channel has been invaded by somebody else, uh, this is an invasion of my property, do something about it. Well, but don't they have to make sure that the public airways are used in the public interest? Well, they aren't the public airways any more than, uh, than the land uh, belongs to the public. The idea that we are all resources to be available to the government to use for the government's purposes, and, of course, they aren't public purposes, they're political purposes. Whenever we think that the government needs to do something because it is too big or too important to be handled by uh, private companies, what we're actually saying is that, what we want is this to be a political football that will be decided by ever, whoever has the most political influence. And that will never be you and it will never be me. I have a little anecdote along those lines. There was once a small pirate radio station in Austin back in the 1990s called Free Radio Austin. And uh, <clears throat> I had absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever, <clears throat> by the way. And uh, But anyway, when they got busted uh, during Discovery, it turned out with the 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 federal government, I, I believe, filed a civil lawsuit against the equipment, some kind of technicality. Anyway, it came out during Discovery that the reason that Free Radio Austin got shut down was because Clear Channel Communications, the uh, number one biggest 
uh, radio uh, company in the world, they were the ones who called the FCC and said specifically, this isn't an exact quote, but they said specifically that Free Radio Austin is cutting in on uh, our listeners, and we're losing dollars. And so they're the ones who called the national government on this tiny little 50- or 100-watt station. Mm. And so I guess that's pu- protecting the public interest is protecting the people who are already the richest and most powerful from any sort of competition. Sure. We, we tend to think that the government's going to protect us, but why would it bother uh, using that immense power to protect us when there are other people that can be far more rewarding? It's also interesting to note that the boys who own uh, Clear Channel, the Hicks brothers, they're the ones who bought the Texas Rangers from George Bush for $14 million, and they're the ones who uh, kicked uh, Howard Stern off the air as soon as he came out in favor of John Kerry. Well... Um, Just like you say, it's the, the people who have the political pull are the ones who uh, get things done in their interest as opposed yes. to the rest of ours. Uh, there's a simple rule involved, and that is that any time you turn something over to the government, it doesn't matter whether it was a scientific matter, a, a medical matter, a financial matter, a commercial matter, a military matter, whatever it was, when you turn it over to the government, it now becomes a political issue to be decided by whoever has the most political influence. Now, just ask yourself, the next time you think government ought to do something, do I really want this to be something to be decided by Bill Clinton, Teddy Kennedy, George Bush, and Newt Gingrich, people like that? Or would it be better off uh, just letting the market sort it out? All right, everybody, it's the weekend interview show. The guest is Harry Brown. We'll be right back to wrap it up. It's the Republic Broadcasting Network. Everybody, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. My name is Scott Horton, and this is the show where I get to talk with my heroes. And in this case, we're talking about Harry Brown. He's the author of 11 books, working on his 12th. It will be called The War Racket, How Politicians Use Americans for Their Own Ends. He's a radio show host on the Genesis Network, and he's the director of public policy at the Downsize DC Foundation. Harry Brown, you wrote a whole book about it, and so I have to ask you, how does one find freedom in this very unfree world? <laughs> well, first step is to be determined to do it and not give up on the idea that there are ways that you can be free. Uh, the book actually covered a lot more than just freedom from government. It also uh, covered freedom from social restrictions, uh, freedom from jealousy, freedom from a lot of things that interfere with the ability to find happiness in this world and a Of course, it isn't possible to sum it all up in one paragraph, even the long paragraphs that I tend to run on to. (laughs) But uh, the book was uh, published back in 1973, and it went out of print in the hardcover at the end of the 70s and then out of print in paperback at the end of the 80s. And fortunately, somebody brought back a uh, 30th, what was the 25th anniversary edition in 1998, but then that publisher went out of business. So within the next couple of weeks, I hope to have it up available for downloading from a website I have called libertyfree.com. Oh, great. Where you can download uh, Why Government Doesn't Work Now and also Fail Safe Investing, a very short uh, but I hope uh, powerful book on investing that I wrote in the 90s. In any event, uh, how I, I, if I can get the time, how I found freedom will be there. Uh, these books are available for downloading for just nine seventy-five, and uh, it's a way of getting these out-of-print books back and available to people. So you might uh, just check my website, harrybrown.org, because certainly when the book is available, I'll make a big splash about it there. Okay, so I kind of get the idea that number one thing you got to do is get rich so that you can take care of yourself and hire a lawyer if you need one and such like that. Am I right? No. Uh, no? Actually, if that's, that is backward, just as we were discussing before about freedom and responsibility. Uh, the way I got rich was by finding freedom. Uh, once I found freedom from the things that I didn't want to do, 
I was able to focus on the things that I wanted to do, and those were the things that I did best. And the result was that I made far more money doing the things I really enjoyed than I could possibly have made doing things that I didn't really like to do that much. And so the object is to find freedom so that you can become rich. And maybe you will and maybe you won't become rich. This is not uh, a book that promises that anybody can be a millionaire uh, because a lot of people may not have the talent uh, to do so. But it does start with wanting to be free. And if you want that and you get a little bit of help like you can get from my book, uh, I hope, then from then on you will be aware of things as they come up and you will take advantage of things as they come up, things that you might have disregarded before as being unrealistic or idealistic. You suddenly realize that it is possible to do these things. So anyway... Uh, I hope people will tune into my show tonight. It's uh, at uh, 10 o'clock Eastern. And just go to harrybrown.org, and there you can, as you said, see other articles on things that we really didn't have the time to get into in great detail today. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for joining me on the show today, Mr. Brown. It's been an honor. Well, I appreciate it, and I thank you very, very much for what you're doing with your show. Uh, I think you probably do a lot more good than you can possibly realize. Well, thank you. I hope you're right about that. Everybody, Harry Brown. You can read everything he writes and listen to his show at harrybrown.org. There's an E on the end, harrybrown.org. All right, everybody, it's the Weekend Interview Show. Uh, Go to weekendinterviewshow.com to listen to any of the archives. I'll be back next week with uh, hopefully a couple of really good interviews for you, so stay tuned.